Well, if you're looking at the topic here, hindrances to contentment, I was thinking about this. There's a number of things that have happened over the last few weeks. I've been thinking about it. Uh, but thinking about it and getting your thoughts down onto paper, not always that easy. My wife asked me yesterday, what are you preaching on? I said, I'm not telling you because I'm struggling with it. Uh, not all of it, but yeah, there's, there's portions as I begin to sit and to try to think about this that I, I begin to struggle somewhat with it. Uh, there was a number of things that I read. I went back actually and I noticed uh, not very long ago and I followed up on it yesterday. According to surveys, and these surveys are taken year after year after year by the same polling place, <clears throat> they showed that happiness uh, and life satisfaction among those uh, adolescents within the United States was increasing from 1991 up until 2011, and it was increasing, increasing, and increasing. So for any of us that were young back in the 90s, you, you know how we always think back things were so much better? Well, the polls actually show that people's happiness was increasing, increasing, increasing. Then all of a sudden in 2012, according to the polls, uh, it suddenly just declined. So happiness immediately in 2012, and nobody seems to know why, began to decline. Then about three to four years later, actually 2016, 2017, they found it wasn't just adolescents that were declining in happiness and contentment. Adults now were beginning to follow suit. And uh, according to the studies, they were nowhere near as happy starting in 2012, all the way up until now, as they were back then. And I've been thinking a lot about why this could happen, uh, and I can't prove it, but I went back and started doing some research. Uh, but I can't prove there's a correlation. I went back and began to look, and did you guys know that internet usage jumped amongst users in the year 2012? That is the exact same year that happiness rates began to decline. Uh, in 2012, statistics showed that over 75% of people were now using internet for social media, and that's the exact same year that happiness started to decline rapidly. Uh, today, guys, 92% of people are using the internet, 80% are using social media on a daily basis, uh, which means a lot of people have, they have access to uh, a lot of different ideas, which is good and bad. They also have access to an influence uh, are influenced by modern culture in a number of ways, which could be both good and bad. Uh, but what they're being taught and what they believe, for all of us who use the old interweb, um, we need to realize that that affects our contentment. And there's actually a lot of studies that go into that, and I'm not going to go any further. I just found that very interesting. As I was studying this, I then found this, and this one literally shocked me. While they were doing the studies, they began to study then people who were religious or went to church and those who were not. And the study showed that Christians registered much higher on their religious well-being, which is to be expected. But then it went on and said that non-Christians actually reported significantly higher life satisfaction. That one is both sad and scary to me, but I point that one out to say, according to the polls, there are a lot of people who are Christians who are not happy or content with things within their life. Uh, and so I, it's a matter of fact uh, that people sometimes are not happy. The question is, does the Bible really have much to say about this, and can it help us when we are struggling in areas in our life with contentment? And the answer is yes. Let me go on over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We'll look at verses 3 through 6 as we begin to try to work this down, and then I'm going to actually begin to look at some hindrances uh, that's, that we struggle with. Notice what Paul tells Timothy. 1 Timothy 6, starting in verse 3, he says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but dotting about questions and strifes of words, whereof come envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself, but godliness with contentment is great gain." Now Paul here begins to contrast the faithful Christian with those who are not going to consent to the inspired scriptures. Instead what they're doing is, is they're going out and they're choosing other sources uh, of gain as their method of contentment. 
here's the point. Their contentment, as Paul points out without going into all the context here, is coming from other sources, ungodly sources or desires. And so this idea that, that people are sometimes not content and will go somewhere else, it's not new. Paul deals with this uh, within the Scriptures himself. And then he goes on and he says this to Timothy in verses 7 and 8. He says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment... Now, that, the word there, raiment, is uh, not always translated very, very well, but we normally look at that as the word clothing. That word there is covering. It could mean clothing. It sometimes is also used for the abode that you live in, so it could mean either one. But he says, having food and covering, whether it's clothing or house, let us be there with content. So the idea, again, is if we have enough money just to provide food, clothing, or even if he's including the house there, we would be extremely blessed, right? Now, with that being said, Paul's not teaching laziness. What Paul is teaching is fulfillment with the basics at that given time. If that's all that I can afford at that time, I, I'm extremely blessed. Now, if I'm blessed enough that I could afford, afford more, that's, that's fine. I would say most of us here struggle. Most people struggle with contentment in some way. And when I use that word people, I'm talking about myself too. It's not just you. Uh, I don't think the majority of people here are content with just food and clothing. How many of you guys have phones and all that other stuff, right? The majority of us have a number of other things. Um, so why are we not as content sometimes as God would tell us to be? Let's go over to Philippians 4, chapter 11. Paul gives the answer to this. Why is it that I, right now, at this point in my life, may not be content as a Christian? <clears throat> well, Paul in Philippians 4, 11 says this. Not that I speak in respect of want. Notice here very carefully. For I have learned... In whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Paul says that he has learned to be content through his varying stages of poverty and wealth. The majority of us, if we can go back and think, most of us probably at some point in our life have gone by where we were barely, barely getting by, right? And we've had times in our life maybe where we were, we were more successful, at least monetarily. Paul points out that he had learned through these different varying stages of life on how to be content. What does he show me? It's not something that I can buy. It's not something that I just finally achieve after being a Christian for so many years. It's something that we actually learn. Have you guys ever noticed that oftentimes older people are much more content in their life than younger people? Even when it seems they may not have that much? Do you guys know why they, why they oftentimes are more content? Because they've seen it all and dealt with it all and struggled through it all. And they have usually, by this older time in their life, they've come to the understanding of what's truly important in life. And that's why they can usually be more content than those who are younger. Well, sometimes the problem is, is people actually are hindered in a number of ways from having contentment. And so here's really what, what we ought to focus on. What are some of these things that hinder us? Uh, I could list a bunch of them. One of them I'm going to point out, I don't really have the answer to it. And this is where I, I really struggled a little bit. One of the hindrances for contentment is today, especially, people have very unrealistic expectations. Uh, a recent study showed today, this study just came out recently, but I know for a fact this is true. A recent study showed that today's college graduate, when they graduate from college, they expect the very first job out of school to pay them double what the going rate is for their salary. So if they come out of school, let's say, to be a, 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 an accountant and their first job is an accountant, let's say the going rate is $40,000. When they come out of school, they expect to make $80,000. They have unrealistic expectations. Guys, I had somebody on Friday ask me, how can I be an engineer tomorrow? How did you get, how did you get to this position in your job? And I said... You have any education in engineering whatsoever? Nope, I don't have any engineering background. 
Uh, have you worked in engineering at all, starting from the ground up and working your way? No, I haven't done any of that, but I'd like to be an engineer tomorrow. Uh, the problem, guys, is culture today has pushed a lot of unrealistic expectations, and that leads to a lack of contentment. That guy told me, I'm not very happy working here doing what I'm doing. I'm not content doing this. I want to be an engineer tomorrow. Well, it's unrealistic, and it's not just with jobs. We're finding this all over. And the reason is, is when we begin to go back and base our happiness on our, our stuff that we have or our accomplishments or how it is that we feel or, or whether or not we're in a relationship, what we're doing is setting a standard which really can never, ever be fulfilled. It's never, it's never enough. Uh, these things in and of themselves, they're not bad. Uh, they're not wrong. The problem is, is they can't be our sole basis for happiness. And a number of people struggle in life with contentment because they have set for themselves unrealistic expectations. And the problem is, is they try to obtain these things, whether it's the job, whether it's the new car, whatever it may be. Uh, and even if they get the newer house or the better job, it's never enough. There's always, there's always another one out there, right? And so when we begin to set unrealistic expectations, the end result has to always be a lack of contentment. Uh, have you guys ever noticed when, for anybody here who's, who's bought a house, and I'm just going to, have you ever noticed that when you go to buy a house, you set your budget at this number, whatever that number is? Do you guys ever notice you always spend more than what you ever thought you were going to spend when you went to look at houses? You went and looked at houses in your price range, and you're like, oh, but the realtor showed us this one, and it's got all the stuff I really want, right? You weren't content once you began to see that there's other stuff out there. Well, there's always, there's always a better house. There's always a better job. There's always something. And so we, we go back and we try, to, we try to get these things. Listen to what James says in James 4, 1 and 2. He says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Now, I want to focus in on just one little phrase here. He says, ye lust and ye have not. That constant internal desire that we have for these things, um, it leads to a number of issues. <laughs> things like murder, things like envy, things like hatred. And in trying to obtain whatever it is, oftentimes what we find is, is we will go out and fight and war or do whatever necessary to get what we want. And guess what, guys? They're still never satisfied. James points out that all of us have this internal struggle that we're dealing with. And again, there's nothing wrong with getting the new house and getting the new car, getting the new job. The problem with wanting is, is that it never stops and oftentimes it leads us to do things that we wouldn't normally do in order to obtain it. Uh, I have all kinds of things that I would like. There's, if, if I had tons of money, guys, there's all kinds of stuff I would go out and buy. I think what happens, though, is as we begin to get older, at least we would hope, that we begin to focus on, on it's not just what I want, but it's what I need and what my family needs. For those of us as we get older, have you ever noticed, oftentimes we spend very little on ourselves, but we're always thinking about what our family needs, right? We don't think twice about doing that for them. Well, many people don't think that way. Uh, if we're blessed enough to have extra, that's great. Uh, but we have to have realistic expectations in life. If you don't, whether it's regarding your house, the money, the job, whatever it may be, I'm going to tell you real quick, you're never going to be content. Uh, and culture today is pushing us to have unrealistic expectations. That's one of the biggest hindrances I find right now amongst Christians and why they're struggling and not, and not content. But here's another one tied to it, and that is, is not only do we have unrealistic expectations, the desires really have no end. Um, you guys ever notice when a child gets a toy that they've been wanting forever? They play with it and play with it and play with it for about 20 minutes, and then they throw it away and they're ready for the next thing. I think oftentimes we are very much the same way, right? The new item, the new job, the new house, the new car. It never seems to be enough. For anybody who's ever bought a new car, how long does the new car smell last? Like until the kid pukes in it or whatever? It's not very long. The new smell doesn't last very long. Uh, and then you're ready for the next new one. As you begin to think about the desires having no end, 
Solomon actually deals with this, and, and I'll just summarize it by talking about financial or monetary items, wealth. Listen to what Solomon says, and he was the richest man of his day, and this is what he learned. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. What's he saying? It's never enough, and you constantly want more. That's what Solomon had learned. When we get into that type of a mindset, guys, surely the outcome is going to be a lack of contentment. He actually goes on and he says this in, in Ecclesiastes 6, 7, and we're talking about the basic necessities of just food. Listen to what he says. All the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. Guys, even our desire for food never stops. If my wife goes out and buys me black licorice, it only satisfies for a short time and I need some more black licorice, right? We've got to continue to work for the food, but yet it, whoever's got it, Children hit 17, especially boys, they eat the entire kitchen cabinet in like two minutes, right? The mouth never stops. I see his hand going up. It's not, just, it's not just that we want other stuff. We actually need other stuff, and we continue to go through it. And so the idea is really that man is constantly utilizing more and more, sometimes out of necessity, but sometimes it's just purely out of desire. I'm going to go over to Proverbs 30. Uh, we've spent a little bit of time talking about the importance of family, especially children. Uh, when you begin to go back and look at the importance of the family, and there was a number of reasons why. Listen to Proverbs 30, verse 15. The horse leech... Okay, so you guys have probably never heard that word. Um, how many of you guys have ever heard the term bloodsucker? That bloodsucker? Yeah, somebody that's always constantly you know, just taking everything, taking everything, They're covetous. Okay, that's the old word for a bloodsucker. It's a covetous person. So I'll just replace it. The bloodsucker hath two daughters, crying, Give, give! There are three things that never satisfied, yea. Four things say not, it is enough. The grave and the barren womb, the earth that is not filled with water, and the fire that saith not, it is enough. What's he talking about? Okay, they've got two daughters, and they want more children. Right? The two that they have is not enough. If you go back and you look within the social structure at the time, the female's life cycle as daughter, wife, and mother, and that social role of the woman was centered on not only the household, but ensuring its continuity. And not only that, based on having more children, you ensured that there was someone to take care of you, whether it was sons and or daughters. And so there was, a, there was a, a great importance placed on family. The, not, that, not that family's wrong. The idea here is, is that more, more, more. We see that constantly throughout the Scriptures. Well, the Proverbs writer then goes on and he gives a couple of examples of things never satisfied. The grave. You guys ever notice the grave's never satisfied? People keep dying, don't they? He mentions the childish, childish, childless mother. How many of you guys have known somebody who was trying to get pregnant but couldn't? They want, and they want, and they want, and they want. Again, there's nothing wrong with that, but they do. Land without water, he gives that as an example. Finally, he gives the example of a fire which constantly needs more wood to stay engulfed. Again, he's just giving the idea here that there is a constant need, and oftentimes dissatisfaction or lack of contentment goes along with that. Now, Jesus helps us to understand this better. Go over to Luke chapter 12. Most of us know this as the parable of the rich fool. Let's read from uh, Luke 12, from 13 down to 21. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. All right, so he's already doing extremely well. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat and drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool! This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? 
So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. All the stuff that we oftentimes want, oftentimes the source of our discontentment are things that we can't even take with us. We're going to go out of this world the same way that we came into this world. The items, again, themselves are not wrong, but it's our focus and our value that we place on these items. And many, they will overlook the importance of the soul and the soul of others in order to chase these things that really they have no bearing or meaning on life itself. He probably didn't need bigger barns, but he wanted it. A lot of us maybe don't need bigger houses. Maybe we don't need... Again, it's, it's not the idea that it's wrong to have it, but it's wrong when our focus is, I want that, 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 and I begin to take my focus off of the spiritual and I keep it on the physical. That's the problem. And for many, this process, the wanting just never ends. And if we allow all these different things and these desires and these wants to be our, our basis for contentment, we're never going to achieve happiness. Uh, man's innate carnal desires that we have are never going to give us contentment because there's always something else to go desire. And so part of the problem is people have unrealistic expectations the other problem is, is it seems like that their desires never have any type of an end to them. They just want, want, want. Well, here's another hindrance, and this is a big problem today, especially with our culture. Another hindrance is being envious of other people. If you're not very familiar with the word envy, it is desiring what other people have by comparison to ourself. And I think many of us, you, you probably heard of the phrase, right? Keeping up with the jo Jones. I think it's keeping up with the Kardashians now, right? Uh, you want what they have because they have it, and you don't. You want to be like them, and you want to have the things that they have. Whether we admit it or not, this type of a desire, this want, leads to a number of things. It leads to hatred and anger towards other people. Sometimes it even leads to hatred or anger of ourselves because we don't have what they do have. Um, I don't think this is so much a problem oftentimes with older people, it is a big problem with younger people. Uh, you know, if you're not wearing the right type of jeans, if you're not wearing the right type of shoes, if you don't have the, the most modern phone. Uh, I think most of us can relate to that, especially when we were, when we were younger. Uh, we wanted the popular shoes and the clothing, and I really could care less what name is on my jeans. Um, I am kind of particular about shoes just because my feet, I only got one pair of them, but I don't have to have a brand name, though. Um, again, there's nothing wrong with the brand name stuff. My point is, is we sometimes want what other people have, not because we need it or just they have it and we don't. And so oftentimes we are envious of other people and we want to be like them. Let's go back to Paul's words on contentment. I'm going to go to 1 Timothy 6, 7 through 10. We actually read verse 7. Let's continue on. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. It doesn't matter, guys, if you have Brooks on or if you've got Nikes, because you're not taking them with you. He goes on, And having food and raiment, let us, therewith be let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted, coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Money itself is not evil. We all have money. I can do a lot of good things with money. I pay my house bill, buy food. He makes it very clear here that money, though, can cause temptations, and money can even be a snare or, we would say, a trap. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. And part of what we see in society today is, is this love of money and those who have money is we oftentimes begin to become envious of those that we should not. Let me go over to Proverbs 23, 17. Uh, there's not a, there's, there is nobody online that I follow that you guys probably know that's famous. Like I don't follow uh, any of these famous people, but I work with a lot of people that are constantly talking about these, these people as almost like their role models. Proverbs 23, 17, the Proverbs writer says, Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. Being a faithful Christian should be my desire. And other faithful Christians ought to be who I look up to. Those are who I should be 
envious of, not in a bad way, but that I want to be and emulate them, which is biblical, what Paul, Paul taught them. Do what you see me doing. But that's not what we often find. We often find people are envious of those who are not faithful followers of God. Proverbs 24, 1, be, now thou, be not thou envious against, that word really, you could translate that of, be not thou envious of evil men, neither desire to be with them. Now we could go a, lot, a long way with that, but the point is, is simply this. Oftentimes the, the people that are, are envied by not only our youth, but sometimes us, are people who aren't even faithful followers of God. Galatians 5, 26 he says, let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. When, when we get to the point where we are envious of other people because of what they have, how, I've known people who disliked someone because they were successful in life, like at their job. They were hard workers and, and they were doing well and somebody really, they disliked them because they were envious of what they had, but yet they weren't willing to work the same, the same way to get it, right? If we're envious of people, we're never going to become content uh, because they're always going to have something better than us. They're always going to maybe work harder than us. Uh, and if we're not willing to do the same thing, we're going to have this lack of contentment. That's not the only type of hindrance we have. Now this one, I struggled a little bit with this one, but I do know this is a serious issue, not only within the people of the world, but within the church. Uh, another hindrance is the feeling of being alone. And that is a big issue. How many of you guys ever known somebody who felt alone? They were alone. Um, there was a lady I would do Bible studies with. She was 104. She didn't have no family left. She just, it was her, right? She was alone. Most of us probably know somebody like that. Whether we're actually alone or whether we just feel like we are alone, which sometimes is the case, that drives a lot of discontentment. And oftentimes when people are alone, they will actually go seek after other people and or things to fill that void, that loneliness. How many of you guys ever watched the hoarder shows on TV? I'm the only one? Okay. Well, if you watch those shows, oftentimes people who are hoarders, a lot of them are dealing with struggles because somebody has passed away. They're dealing with grief from the loss of a loved one, something like that, and they need something to fill that void. Well, when we begin to struggle with this feeling of being alone, sometimes we'll go out and we will seek companionship from anybody just to have somebody. And that leads to a whole host of problems, guys. It could lead to a number, it could lead to a number of sins, like fornication, adultery. You could get in with the wrong group and find yourself, let's say, going out and stealing catalytic converters on the weekend or whatever it is. And it's all because you need to fill that void within yourself. It doesn't have to lead to... Loneliness doesn't have to lead to issues of sin, but oftentimes when that's not the case, it also will lead to issues of depression. And so people who are feeling lonely, whether they actually are or whether they just feel that way, oftentimes they are discontent. We usually feel like we're the only ones dealing with it. I don't know if you guys have ever gone back through the Scriptures and looked for people who were struggling with feeling alone. I'm going to go to David over in Psalm 25, 14. Listen to what David says. He says, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him, and He will show them His covenant. Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord, and He shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn thee unto me, and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate. That word there is lonely. I'm, I'm desolate and afflicted. Now, some of the greatest Bible characters we have within our scriptures are those who at points in their life they struggled with feeling or being alone. And for those that are struggling with that right now, that, that causes this feeling of a lack of contentment. Well, just because we're Christians doesn't mean we're not going to deal with this. You may, you may feel alone Let's say in your marriage, and you're currently, you're currently married and you still feel alone. Sometimes we find that that happens. Sometimes what happens is, is we lose a loved one. We lose a very close friend. There was a recent study that I pulled up as I was studying on this. Did you guys know that, and this is sad, 58% of adults here within the United States consider themselves lonely. 
And that number drastically began to rise, guys, around 2012 when internet usage began to rise and when people began to go on social media. And I'll point out the fact, you know what's interesting? You can have thousands of people you know across the world on social media and yet you still feel alone. A lot of people, I, I get told quite often, I'm very lonely. I have 5,000 followers on whatever social media site you're on, but I feel very lonely. I told you I don't have the answer to some of these, but I know that it's a problem. Sometimes we feel alone even when we have people next to us. Sometimes we lose loved ones. Uh, we, lose, we lose marriage uh, partners, our spouses. We lose our friends. Um, this number has increased 7% in the last four years. Loneliness as a whole has jumped drastically in the last couple of years, four years. And I don't really have a quick answer for this. There are some things we can do. We can go back, and, and I have to say, this is, it's hard. I, I get this. When I, we can go back and, and try to focus on what it is that we have. Now, when I say that, I know it's extremely hard. That, that is hard to do when you are struggling with loneliness and, and you're not feeling content in life. Uh, but you can go back and focus on what you do have. Uh, for the Christian maybe who's lost a spouse recently or a close friend, I know that it's extremely hard. You can go back and rely on fellow Christians to help encourage you as you're, as you're struggling through this. You can think about uh, your relationship with Christ as a, as a faithful Christian and, and the hope and the promises that we have. Uh, but the death of a loved one or a close friend causes severe, serious grief and could cause that person to struggle for a very long time. And guys, if, if anybody's dealing with that, um, serious grief and the struggle of the passing of a loved one up to one year is still considered normal. And I'm talking outrageous, horrible grief. Up to one year is actually still normal. Anything beyond that, you definitely need to be getting some counseling and some help, Pro probably well before that. But for those of you maybe that know somebody who is dealing with this, <laughs> don't tell them to get over it. We're all different. And for many people, yes, you can heal but oftentimes that wound, it never closes. And for anybody who has lost you know, a loved one, you kind of understand where I'm going with that. So then what can we do with these feelings of severe loneliness when I'm not content? I didn't have a lot of passages, and I told you I don't have a lot of answers for this one in particular. I struggled a little bit with this one, and I'll tell you why. Listen to Hebrews 13.5, and that's where Jerry read before I came up here. He said, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. There's the hard part, guys, right there. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. We're never really alone, even when we feel that we are. I know many people, when they lose a loved one, they feel like they are all alone. You're never really alone. And when I say that, I know it's much easier said than done, because if I'm going to be totally transparent with you, the greatest fear in my life is the death of my spouse or my children. And I don't know about you guys, I struggle with that. I struggle with that greatly. That is a fear that I think about all the time. How, how will life change? How will I continue on after that? That is, that is the thought. I don't, I don't care if my house burns down. I don't care if I wreck a vehicle. I've done that before. It's the thought of losing loved ones. For me, that is my greatest fear in life. And for many people, that is in essence, destructive to the ability to be content. To have something like that and to lose it. And for many of us, we've been there. For some of us, we haven't yet, and we're fearful of it. Another one is, another hindrance is a lack, or a lack of trust or a, a, a failure to have belief in God. Discontentment oftentimes will come from us not trusting God's Word. We think we know better how to do it, we either don't agree with His Word, we don't think it's inspired, we think it's outdated, we think it's just a suggestion, and so because we don't agree with it, we decide to go our own way and do our own thing. And oftentimes what we find is, is we're still not content. Uh, listen to Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. 
In all thy ways acknowledge him. In some of the ways? No. Not some of them. All of them. Even when you don't agree with it. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. I'm going to answer a question for you. Do you guys know why the majority of the world is not content? Here's, here's the answer. The reason that the majority of the world is not content is because they're content in following the ways of the world. They're not following the ways of God. Their paths are directed by anyone and everyone but God. And so they're all walking in different directions, doing whatever it is they need to do to try to be content. And the majority of the time, they're not content. I talk to a lot of people every day who will tell me they are followers of God or that they are Christians and that they have faith, and yet they're unhappy for the most part and they are living contrary to the will of God. Let me read to you Romans 10, 17. Most of you are familiar with this passage. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If you're not living according to the Word of God, you can't have true faith. And if you don't have true faith, you can't find true contentment in life. And the reason is, is because you don't, know, you don't know what should be satisfying to you. You have the wrong focus. I think a lot of discontentment is, for us as Christians, is us not wanting to wait for God to provide when we can't do it ourselves. Um, this came up at, at work. I was talking about something, and I was like, you know, men in general, we are fixers, right? We are fixers. If something's broke, we want to fix it. Oftentimes, we're even very prideful. We don't want someone else to help us, and we're even reluctant to accept the help. Well, oftentimes what it is is we find ourselves, we're too impatient to wait for God to provide. How many of you guys have ever had someone say this when they're struggling? Where is God in my life when I am struggling to this point or when I am, when I am really not content and I am struggling? Where is God? You guys want to know the answer to that? He's in the same place that he was when his son was hanging on the cross. He knows exactly what you're going through and he knows exactly how you feel. And so we oftentimes, as we go through that, we begin to become impatient. We don't think that God understands. And then we decide that we'll try to resolve our own problems in our own way. And this certainly is not new, and it's certainly not biblical. Listen to Jeremiah 10, 23. And tell me if this doesn't sound like the world around us today, guys, and probably us at some point in our lives. Oh, Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Man oftentimes does not do what God would have them to do. They don't follow the steps that have been laid out for them in a way that would bring contentment to their life. They do things their own way. And if we're going to be honest, oftentimes God's agenda is not our agenda. We want to do what we want to do God has laid everything out for us, and it works towards man's eternal salvation. I'm going to go over to Isaiah 40, verses 28 through 31. I'm not going to get into the context of this, but I just want to focus uh, here on the very last couple passages. Isaiah 40, starting in verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast, that not, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not? neither is weary. There's no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might he increaseth strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. With God the impossible is possible. The problem is, is that oftentimes we don't have a faith in the promises of God that allows us to have this position of contentment in our life. Sometimes it's due to a lack of belief in God. Sometimes it's due to a lack of waiting for the will of God to be played out within your life. Here's another hindrance, and this is a big one. Uh, and I won't get into details uh, on this, but I've seen this at work a few times, and I have to be very careful what I say so that I don't bring up prior hurts for somebody else. Another hindrance 
with contentment is oftentimes that we don't or can't love ourselves. If a person doesn't love themselves the way that God loves them, if they can't look at themselves as being a valuable creation of God, they're never going to be content. Being very careful uh, with what I'm saying, at work I have seen the effects of when people don't like themselves. And it manifests in a number of ways. Sometimes they don't provide for themselves or take care of themselves. Sometimes they, they go and they, they focus on and they, they find comfort in food. Sometimes it's drugs. Sometimes it's alcohol. Sometimes they, outlash, they, they lash out by literally acting out sexually. Sometimes they'll act out in other self-harmful and destructive ways. I've seen all of the above within my work setting, and many of us know people who struggle with this. Sometimes they just see themselves as a victim. And the problem is, is for whatever reason they're dealing with, sometimes it's not always their fault. Sometimes it's been caused by somebody else. They can't, they can't love themselves. And so this person, they're never going to be satisfied with anything because they're not satisfied with themselves. They can't look at themselves as being something that is of worth we have to love ourselves as God loves us. That begins by putting our identity into, into Christ. Listen to Romans 6, 3, and 4. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? And therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Putting on Christ makes me a new creation in Christ. And when I am living as a faithful follower of God, I should be able to be content simply through my faith and where it is that I'm at at that time. Paul said he learned whether he was doing well or whether he was struggling as far as uh, poverty. He learned to be content in, in all of those situations. Part of that is loving myself for where I'm at. Now, I can speak from experience, guys. There was a point in my life where I didn't like myself very well. And maybe you've been there. It is hard to be content when you don't even like yourself. And we can't pretend that this doesn't happen within the church. It does. It could be for a number of reasons. It could be, it could be physical things. It could be monetary things. It could be, it could be that you're lo lonely. It could be a number of things. But if you can't love yourself the way that God loves you, you're never going to be content. Listen to Matthew 22. Verses 37 to 39. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Now listen to the second one. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, notice this, as thyself. You guys know that for most people, there is an inherent desire to live. There's self-preservation. Why? Well, the majority of people love themselves. And so there's that idea of self-preservation. God's the standard of love. Listen to 1 John 4.10. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us. And He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is an area that oftentimes many people have struggled with, and I don't have a better way to say it than this, guys. God does not make junk. If you're here and you are one who does not love yourself, you are struggling with yourself for whatever reason, and there may be reasons that, there may be things that you need to correct. Some of those things may be out of your control, but God does not make junk. Every one of our souls was worthy of the sacrifice of Christ. Listen to John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. We should all be striving for contentment, but as I begin to draw this to a close, we need to remember that contentment is a double-edged sword. And really, I could have added a, a whole other point and spent probably 20 minutes on this. Many people are not content when they should be, and many people are content when they should not be. 
There are many people who are not faithful Christians, and they're content with their life. They should not be. There are a number of Christians who are not content, but they should be. And so it's really a double-edged sword. If we'll go back and use the Bible as our guide, we can always be sure where we stand. But as I draw this to a close, guys, I only listed a couple of the hindrances that we have in life that cause people to not be content. Many have unrealistic desires, and really culture today pushes that. For many, the desires never end. They want stuff, and they want bigger and better, and they, they are envious of other people. They want what they have just because they have it, and maybe they're famous. For many people, they are struggling with contentment because they do feel alone, and sometimes they are. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they could be within a marriage and feel alone even in their marriage. Sometimes it's because they don't have a, a faith or a belief in God. Sometimes it's because they just can't love themselves. And granted, sometimes there are reasons behind that. But all of those can be fixed or dealt with over time, or at least the wounds can close on some of them. And so as I draw this to a close, my desire would be that each one of us is content. Certainly as a body of Christ, contentment is aided by us encouraging and edifying one another. But for anybody who's watching this, or even if you're here, you can't be content until you actually become a follower of Christ. The process is not complicated. Go through the conversion accounts. There were, people were going around and they were teaching who Jesus was. They were teaching why He came and the establishment of the church. And, and when people heard who Jesus was and they believed that, they had faith. They believed Hebrews 11.6 and John 8.24. They understood about sin in their life and why Jesus even came and had to die on the cross and they repented of their sins, Luke 13.3 and 5. They confessed Christ, Romans 10.9 and 10. And they were baptized by, in water for their mission of sins. It was that simple. They heard the Word of God, they believed, they repented, they confessed, and then they were immersed in water. That's what we find in the conversion accounts. And when they did that, they were added to the church by the Lord Himself. That's how easy it is to become a Christian. I think the hard part comes after you become a Christian. Learning and knowing the Word of God, being faithful according to it, and being able to be content while you do all that. If there's a way that we can assist you in any way, you can come, you can come forward as we're led in a song of invitation.